Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PML. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going team by team. I would be very careful about slings. Am I going to get sued? We got legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube, and it's Offensive Line Day today, Sam, on the PFF NFL Podcast. The Big Uglies. Yeah, that's mean. I mean, it's just what they called them. Especially with Ramon Foster coming on the show. I mean, he's, he's not a big ugly, he's just a big. A just big. a big, just a big. We're going to... We're going to get into how, how big he was when he tested. He's a big fella now. He is a big fella yeah. now. Uh, but we love Ramon. He's a former Steeler, does uh, Titans radio locally. So uh, he's got some offensive line takes. That's coming up very soon on the show. So Sam and I, we're going to go through the top tackles, guards, centers, and then we'll let Ramon break it all down as well, and then we'll send you out of here. Yep, as well as uh, he's going to tell you why he used to hate PFF. Yeah, we get into a little bit of backstory. We have a couple of the uh, – uh, you know, former former enemies turned friends. You know, guys like uh, Bob Sturm. You know, we've had him on the show a few times. He's like, oh, I used to hate you guys, but then, you know, I grew to respect you. And now, now here we are. We're friends. Ramon's got a similar story. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll break that all down. Yeah. Dynamite drop in there. That was, good. that was yeah. good. Yeah, that's good. We can have a, that is something that will happen. Hope we have a better Agreed. back and forth. With him? No, with just you and I. Oh, on the show here yeah. today. Um, anyway, we're uh, we're excited to go. So let's talk O line. Let's talk. Let's talk high level. We're going to do this uh, quick ranking style, right? So we're not going to do our two hour long winded. Yeah. You and I break down everything. We'll just do quick. Uh, you know, top tackles, top interior offensive linemen, and Rapid go from fire. there. That sound good? Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds good in theory. I, I don't imagine we'll actually achieve that successfully. All right. Well, let's. Um, are we ranking the top five? We didn't really Well, what discuss. are your high-level thoughts? This is a good way of starting off a quick-hitting show. What are your high-level thoughts on this offensive line group as a general concept? So I think, I think most people believe the, it, that it's deep, um, that it's a deep offensive line class, particularly a tackle. I think the, the depth uh, on the interior is, is definitely more in the middle of the draft, not at the top. The consensus draft board – has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven offensive tackles within the top 30, um, and then a few more in the second round range, and then there's a bit of a, a drop off. So I do believe it's a it's a place where you can get offensive linemen. I think there's three or four offensive linemen that I feel really good about. Yep. And then a couple that I could that I think could <coughs> could definitely develop. So I would say my thoughts mesh similarly with. Um, Maybe the perception and where the where the big board lands. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a. I think the top of this class is very strong. I think there's a group at the top that are very good prospects that I really like. Um, I think there's depending on your your risk tolerance, I guess, or your appetite for projects. I think there's a lot of guys that tick the project box later on in the draft where you look at them and say, okay, they've got all the physical tools to be a top end tackle at the NFL level. They do not have the tape to be a top end tackle yet. So, you know, if you have a Jeff Stoutland or if you have a, you know an elite level offensive line coach in the building and you're confident in your capacity to coach people up this might be the draft for you right grab one of those guys in the mid rounds and you could be golden uh, if you don't have that and you're just relying on let's take a guy and hope he gets better in the next couple of years maybe this is a draft that's going to spit out some rough tackle play all right I'm going to let me go through here's the top five on the consensus board and so let's do it like this I'll list out the top five or six, and then we'll talk about where we might deviate from it. Okay. okay. So at number nine on the overall consensus board is Joe Alt from Notre Dame. Who's number five on the PFF big board. Okay, yeah, give me the PFF rank as well. Yep. Uh, Talise Fuaga yep. is at 14 on the consensus board, number two tackle. 12 on our on the PFF is he tackle? He's tackle two for us. Yep. Right? Uh, right behind him, 15 on the on the consensus board is Olu Fashanu. Fashnu. 18 Sorry. for us, uh, tackle four. Okay, so he's tackle three. J.C. Latham is fourth on the consensus board among tackles, 19 overall. Yep, 19 for us. From Alabama. And uh, tackle five. Uh, Troy Fontenot is tackle five and 20 on the consensus board from four, Washington. 14 on the PFF big board and tackle three. So that's one of the guys Trevor absolutely loves. Yep. And this uh, post-combine 
post workout and you know seeing the movement skills and everything loves Fontenot. Yep. Um, Amarius Mims is tackle six on the consensus board, number twenty two overall from Georgia. Uh, the same twenty two and six. Wow, us. perfect. Um, and then the last first round, just plagiarism scandal after plagiarism scandal. Wow, we've we've uncovered something else. Now who's copying whom? The consensus board is copying. PFF. I wouldn't like to suggest to speculate and get into more legal trouble. <laughs> we, can't, we can't have such things. <laughs> uh, Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma is at 30 on the consensus board and tackle seven. Uh, uh, also, the same. No comment. 30 and seven. Where's Jordan Morgan from Arizona? He's at 35 on the consensus board. <laughs> 40 and uh, ah, eight. Throw us off the scent a little bit, consensus board. Nice uh, job. Doc Copy and PFF. Sneak, it's not Trevor. Sneaky. Um, so Jordan Morgan tackled eight, whatever that is, and then uh, Kingsley Suamataya. Ooh, nice. How's that? Is that right? I don't know, but it sounded – it was confident. Let's roll with it. Yeah. Rarely do I roll with anything confident. With a Polynesian name right off the bat and just, just, just hit it. But he's at 41. That gives us nine tackles on the consensus top 41 and then a bit of a drop off before you get to Patrick Paul from Houston who's been as high as into the 30s but he's at 70 overall um so there's a lot of tackles being talked about let's just say in the top 40 41 where would Joe Walt number one are we in agreement with that I'm not are you what why Um, what what do you mean why you're wrong yeah of course he's number one no Joe Walt number one no Who's number one for you? Fashnu. Whoa! Fashnu has the best footwork Discuss. of any offensive lineman I can remember entering the draft for a long time. Um, I think he has the best pass protecting skill set of any offensive lineman to enter the draft in a long time. I don't really care that his run blocking isn't good at the moment. Number one, I think I could probably get him better at that. Even if I can, it's more important to me that he has the not just the elite potential, but the elite play at pass protecting left tackle. Like, give me that and let me roll with everything else. I have way more questions about everybody else than I have about fashion. All right, I'm gonna gonna take a break to tell you about 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life. And then I'm gonna tell you about fashion. I'm I'm gonna talk about fashion and alt. Here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right, Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future. So you could focus on what's ahead, knowing your family's protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was, desi- was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. And you can get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. That's meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFFNFL. Policies issued by Western, Western Southern Life Insurance Company not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting health questions. Um, so I'm going to say Alt is the best tackle, best overall combination, pass pro, run blocking, production, measurables, um, data likes him, Scouts like him. Model loves him. I'm going to say Joe Walt's number one. Fosh News, fascinating. He is one of the – I've been watching him closely this entire season um, because I think I thought that the NFL would like him more. We've said that a few times because I, the pass protection footwork is just incredible. Um, when he played – I mean, he, he has one of the best pass blocking profiles we've ever seen at PFF. Yep. Uh, when you put it into just true pass sets, Fosh News is as good as it gets. Mm-hmm. Um, I looked at it historically. He's up in a similar range with guys like Ronnie Stanley, guys like Laramie Tunsil, guys like Zach Tom, who was a fourth-round pick for the Packers and has developed into a very good NFL tackle just two years into the league. One of the better pass blocking, blocking profiles in those ranges. But his run blocking, as you said, the difference from a run blocking grade to pass blocking grade is drastic. And it's way worse than any of those other guys. Um, so there's a couple things to do with that. The other interesting thing is that PFF War, which I do trust quite a bit, I think it's one of the best things we've developed here. Um, and I know it's not everybody doesn't have access to all of it, but War um, does actually focus on run blocking quite a bit. So in my model, which is driven by War and everything, it doesn't love Foshnu, but he's one of the guys I think I would make an exception for. And there's a couple ways we could do that. I do think the pass protection is so good so good and he's so young um so he reminds me of a, a tunsil and we'll, later we'll talk to ramon and i brought this up i compared him to tunsil 
David Bakhtiari, yep. right? Guys that uh, were better pass protectors than run blockers and developed their strength over time. Like Bakhtiari is the really good example for me. Remember how often he was bull rushed as a rookie? All the time. His run blocking <clears throat> uh, profile wasn't great, but it developed over time. Um, also, if you look at the PFF grades by run concept, outside zone, like wide zone tackles tend to grade better. So I think you could put Fashnu because with his movement skills, if you put him in a wide zone type of scheme, I'm not saying it's easier as a tackle, but I think you can get that production out of him and mitigate some of the run blocking issues because he doesn't finish. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't stick on blocks. That might be a little bit better in a zone blocking scheme where you just, hey, get, get in somebody's way, create a lane and go. So I think there's ways to work around this. I just... I love watching the dude in pass protection. Yeah. And I think the only times he was gotten beaten, that he got beaten, was his own fault. Like, he just let his technique slip. He did it against Ohio State a bunch of times. He rushed into a set a few times. And I don't think that Ohio beat. State game was that bad. This is the thing. So a lot of people, if you don't like Fashnu, you're like, ah, oh, he beat up on bad players. Go watch Ohio State. They had a legit D-line, and they ate him for lunch, right? I don't think he was that bad in that Ohio State game. Half the, Number one, that accounts for like the majority of the pressure he gave up in his entire career, right? So even if you just give him, even if you just give him a break and say the guy had a bad day at the office, you can almost explain away a game, like one bad game in his college career effectively. Number two, if you look at the pressures in that game, number one, none of them were hits, right? It was hurries only. Number two... That doesn't matter. Number two, that most of them matter. were... Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. It I explained does later on the show to Ramon why it doesn't matter. No, because let matter. me tell you why you're full of shit on that particular... Because the blocks were bad. I mean, the, the, the results were bad. It doesn't no, matter if it's a hit or because not. because in this particular instance, the difference between the hit, the sack, and the pressure is the fact that he's still between the quarterback and the pass rusher okay. at the end of the play, right? He's getting bull rushed into the quarterback a few times, but he's also throwing on the anchors just before the quarterback arrives. He's actually stopped the pass rush it's just that he hasn't stopped it like quickly enough so that the guy isn't like right in his face making life difficult right but he has actually stopped him running through the quarterback and murdering the guy right so the difference between a hit and a sack and the hurry <clears throat> that Fashnu gave up a bunch of times against Ohio State is Fashnu. it's not the quarterback changing the outcome of the play at the end of it by just getting rid of the football so I don't think that game, which is by far the worst game of his career, was actually that bad. I think if you watch that game, you actually come out of that at least fairly impressed by Fashnu, not looking at it as a reason that he's not OT1. Um, again, I, I, I look at it slightly differently. I, I really think, I don't think it was a good game, but I thought it was all, it wasn't stuff where he was just overpowered, outmanned. He wasn't outskilled. I really just think his technique was off. Like he felt rushed. I mean it's still his fault, but he I, I thought he rushed his sets like everything that he did well in other games. Now you could say, well that's his only time going up against NFL competition. That's why. But I, dude, if he it's is not though, I mean. But if he's just like trusting himself in his pass set, he can yeah. block anybody. Right. So I, I from that from that lens, I like Fashnu. I I think that's but there's all these other things to correct. There's these things to correct. And the run game issue, which is why I can't put him in the same bucket as Alt. Um, like he played Michigan two weeks later and gave up one hurry. No, I understand. So it's not like that's the only time he faced any level of high level competition. Like half of Michigan's team is coming to the NFL this year. And uh, the dude, uh, JT, um, I'm not going to say his name with confidence because I don't have it right in front of me at the moment. JT from Ohio State had four pressures against him yeah. out of the 19 that he's given up in his entire career. At least three, I think, were bull rushes, one of which. Yeah. One of which, but he just wasn't. He wasn't. He just wasn't. He usually gets to his landmark so yeah. quickly, and in that game, he just wasn't. He just wasn't doing it. Right, and, and I he again, got bull rushed. Yeah, and again, I think. And he one was, time he was peeking for a stunt. He was yes. peeking for a stunt, which That's he's awesome at, and he got he got caught peeking too much, right. and then he got whooped. Right. So um, I like Fosnu quite a bit. By the way, guy is also one other element. One other element. The guy's given up four pre, uh, four penalties in his college career. No, it's he's good. also like a wild, he's never given up more than a, he's never been penalized more than once in a game so barely gives up any pressure has the best fluid movement skills of any offensive tackle I can remember hitting the league since at least Tyron Smith I would say which is 2011 right so he's got all the tools to work with the pass protecting tape is, is absurd he never gets penalized and the only downside is his run blocking isn't particularly good which you can say about half the tackles in the NFL ones who aren't able to pass block well. So I'm willing to go with that. Um, so number one, I think he's the best tackle. I also have more concerns 
about Joe Alt than other people seem to. Go for it. Uh, I just don't think he's as good as people say he is. Like, it's not, I, I you know, I've, I've seen people sort of speculate um, this idea of, oh, is he too big? You know, 6'9 and whatever the hell he is. Like, I think that's actually a fair criticism. It's not easy being 6'9. I mean, there, we, we looked this up a few weeks ago. But. I do think that he, so I think his game against Ohio State is actually as bad as Fashnu's game against Ohio State. I think he similarly struggled with the power, the bull rush. Like, he seeded ground a lot by just getting moved backwards. Like, his feet were moving back the whole way. Like, he, I don't think he had a great game against Ohio State as well. So, if we're hammering Fashnu for giving up some pressures against Ohio State, are we doing similar for Alt? Yeah. My, my, um, it's funny. When, um, when Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields came out, I remember comparing the two, and I said, it feels like, when Trevor Lawrence is off, he's too quick. Everything he does is too quick. He's rushed, like what I just described with Foshnu. In fields, as we know, I mean, things were going too slow. He's sitting there and just waiting too long to make plays. Um, I feel like there's an alt Foshnu comparison there. I've got in my notes that Alt is actually too patient sometimes and does let guys get into his pads. And at 6'9", and maybe still growing, he's in college, he's young, um, might be an issue as far as you know facing power facing the the six foot two like the brandon graham low pad level guys facing the hassan reddicks the right. speed guys yeah there might be some issues there with alt but i also you know watched him in 2022 and he continued to grow in 23 and i, I just think there's still there's still room to grow he's already smooth great athlete uh has has all the tools that you want and he's productive i think the whole body of work um that Alt brings to the table. Now, he's not a mauler, people mover type in the run game. I don't think you need to be. Um, I think he can make every block needed. Um, so, sure, I don't, again, nobody's a perfect prospect or anything. I just right. think he's one of the cleanest I really like, tackle prospects yeah. for what he is now and having the tools to continue to improve. I do really like him. I just think that, I, again, it's, it feels like the process started off as Fashnu versus Alt, and it was one versus one A. And now it's like, well, Alt's perfect, and Fashnu can't run block, so he's he's now OT four, whatever. That didn't change about. this year. That was, you know, that I didn't know. change. With That's Fashnu. what I'm saying. So yeah. I don't quite understand why they've diverged so heavily postseason um, to one guy being the clear top tackle in the draft, and the other guy now being talked about as like a you know mid round prospect or mid mid first round prospect. To me, they are still 1-1-A, one and, one and I still think I would default to the guy with special pass-protecting tools and tape versus the guy that is just is the better composite, the better all-around prospect. I'll give this, too, from a, from a model perspective. Alt is one of the, one of the, best, um, one of the best I've, ever, I've seen from a model perspective and some similar guys, Ryan Ramchek. So this, these four guys are in that same area. Ryan Ramchek, Isaiah Wynn, Mike McGlinchey, and Garrett Bowles. And so three out of the four became well above average starters. Ramchek, an elite starter. Isaiah Wynn had bouts of that, but he was also kind of a small tackle. I have him as an average. He was, by PFF war, average starter per season when he played tackle. Had some issues when he you know, moved to guard, did all this other stuff. But three out of four, really good there. And uh, I think Alt is in that bucket. So I like Alt as the one. Um, I think uh, Talise Fuaga... I would say is tackle two. So I'm actually in line with the with the board, with the consensus board of Alt one, Fuaga two, Foshnu three. Um, Fuaga, I think I know you like him too, but similar profile for me as far as like the big classic right tackle wins like a right tackle wins with crazy power, and um, you know good in pass pro. Uh, the idea of moving guys from right tackle to left tackle, we talk about that a lot. I have no problem if you just say, hey, he's he's a right tackle. We don't want to mess with moving him. But um, I think Fuaga is going to be a real good player. Fuaga's tape is the most fun thing to watch of any offensive lineman in this draft. It's the <laughs> the movement that he generates with the power once he touches people is just comical, like genuinely funny. Um, like he he creates movement on plays that aren't really supposed to exist. Like he he pass blocks like a run blocker. Sometimes there are the, you know those plays where. You know, it's like a, it's a bootleg to one direction and the tackle is basically just supposed to sort of, you know, shove the D lineman into the thing a little, you know, into the line a little bit. And you're just sort of crunching left like you're running outside zone. And then the bootleg is to the other side and the quarterback's out in the zone. Yeah. Fuaga shoves a guy and it like launches him into the defensive tackle and caves the entire line down. And he was just like, you know, 
just pushing him just to just to give you know just to just pretend he's running outside zone and it like destroys an entire side of the line that dude he he reminds me a bit of like the, you know like world strongmen the sort of funny things they have to do where it's like oh here's a car pick it up and walk down the it, he just does ridiculous strongman things but on that football field where he shoves a guy and there's a disproportionate response to shove to his shove than there is to anybody else. Do you think there are any comparisons to... Um, so, Dewan Jones last year was a potential... We, at this time last year, we were calling him a late first-round prospect. He ends up going in the fourth for, you know, mostly off-field and effort concerns and not working out and all that. But Dewan Jones always had a better pass-blocking profile than run-blocking profile. And as a rookie with the Browns, it was similar, right? Like, dudes could not be uh, get around him. He was so huge. He was very good in pass protection. But for a monster, he actually didn't crush people in the run game and he was always like a little slow getting to the second level like the the movement skills i think hurt dewan jones as a rookie do you think there are any comparisons to fuaga i I think there are similarities in pass pro where they you know he wins like a right tackle like i said with size and length but is he just a much better run blocker than what we've seen from dewan jones and makes him probably a top half of the first round prospect rather than a late first like we had with dewan um I think they're very different players. The guy that he reminds me of a bit is Phil Lodeholt. Uh, remember the old Vikings right tackle? I mean, I do. I just don't know if, every, if everyone else does. So Phil Lodeholt yeah. was this old... Do right, you have his old grades? Yeah, right tackle for the Minnesota Vikings uh, in the sort of late 2000, or 2010, 11, 12, 13, that kind of range, right? Uh, and at one point, the Vikings had Bryant McKinney at left tackle and Phil Lodehole at right tackle. And they, they were both like 6'8", 340, that kind of thing. McKinney was always this strange player where even though he looked like he should be this road-grading monster, he was always actually a finesse yeah. footwork left like the left tackle that was better in pass protection than, than run blocking. Lodo was actually this like dominant physical monster as a run blocker, but was always way better at pass protection than he looks like he should be because he was 6'8", 340, not tremendously athletic, like wasn't, you know, just a physical freak or a, a, an athletic movement skills guy. He ran like a 5'5", five five. like he was, he, ran, he moved and ran like he was 6'8", 340. Right. Um, but he did have that monstrous power and Fuaga is sort of similar. He's got ridiculous strength. He moves well for a guy that size, but isn't like freaky with it. Um, but is is definitely better as a pass blocker than you think a guy like that should be. Yeah, uh, it's funny because you know I was doing my research the other day for no reason, watching the 2002 NFL draft, and Mel Mel nailed it right. You know, Bryant McKinney goes number seven overall because you just mentioned how he was more of a finesse player. He was like, he looks like he should be a monster run blocker. He's not. He's not. He's right. he's a pass pro. He's a you know he's a pass pro type of guy. Even though he weighed two three forty three whatever he was, Mount uh, Mount McKinney. Mount McKinney. Um, so Fuaga is he tackle three for you? Probably, like the consensus board. Probably yeah. And then who who would be where? Else? So J C Latham is tackle four again on the consensus board. You're lower on Latham though. Yep. Mims would be my next guy. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. That's fair. I would say so. My the numbers like Latham for me. I think the workout numbers would drop him. So like when you factor that in, he's a little bit lower. Latham's interesting at six 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 three forty ish, um, with the monster quads. Do you, you like him as a guard? My my issue with Latham, I think he can handle playing right tackle. I, he has some ugly losses when he's got a redirect counter yes. uh, against counters against any kind of inside move i've got some issues with latham yeah. so it's not just like getting to his landmarks getting to a spot facing speed though i could see that being an nfl issue as well but for me it's any kind of inside move we've got some some issues with latham so actually i mean very very different players but he there's an element of uh Duan jones game to what latham does so where compared to latham okay where the footwork is sort of heavy leaden footed like it's he has the opposite footwork and i say this later when we talk to uh ramon he has the opposite footwork of fashion like it it gets there most of the time but god it feels slow and deliberate and like elephantine it's just lumbering uh but he's strong as hell and he has long arms so sometimes he can get more or less in the right place and then just stop you with an arm you know with a punch with a just stun your momentum because he's that big and strong. And there's so many reps that are, 
like that for Dewan Jones, where he's not in good position, but he's nine foot tall. Oh yeah, you know, eight hundred pounds with arms that are longer than anybody else in the league. And recovery, if he gets man. Any of that on you? Not yeah. even recovery. But if he gets anything on you, it's just hard to get around. There's too much of him, right? It's like when we used to play basketball the Y, right? There's plenty of plays where it's like I'm past you and I have a shot, and because I can't use my left hand, you're just too big to get am, the ball past. I am YMCA Wemby. Right. I am it's, Wemby so, at the Y, where you think you've got a shot, but yes. boom, I am changing the YMCA geometry <laughs> exactly. of the basketball court. And that's the thing. It's not that you have any kind of recovery ability, because you don't. It's just that using with the angle I have to shoot the ball at, <laughs> I can't get it past you. That's the phrase I use for Wemby all the time. Like The, the geometry of the basketball court is completely different. Everything yeah. you thought you could do is different, Changes. because his length is just at a different world. Right. That's and, what Dewan Jones is as yeah. an offensive tackle, and there's a bit of that to J.C. Latham, where he's so strong and long that even when he's not in good position and he's not recovering, it's just whatever he gets on you is enough to give him a shot. Um, so Amarius Mims is an interesting one, right? Again, so I think from a, for me, from a data perspective, it's like, yeah, fine. I have no problem taking, taking a shot on Mims in the first round. He's just got 803 career snaps. Very rare do you, get to, do you see an offensive tackle yeah. with such uh, little experience as Mims but with the frame, the movement skills, the ability to probably play left or right tackle just because of that athleticism, and and you could see like you could see the technique technique issues, right? You could see he's just he's just whiffing sometimes. I think he's got strike zone issues with the, with his hands, things that are correctable. But you don't have dudes at his size that move as well as he does six seven three forty that move as well as he does. And but the problem is, okay, does it take time to develop? Can he do this? In year one, is he going to be a year two, three, four guy? Um, I think those are the questions with Mims, and I think those are the only reasons. Like, if he had another 800 snaps under his belt, maybe he's we're talking about him more as a, as a top 10 type of player. Yeah, so I, I generally, I, I, we said this before we went live, I don't like developmental athletic offensive tackles because generally speaking, those guys don't have good tape. Uh, and I don't know if you're ever going to get them to having good tape. Uh, Mims has good tape. There's just not enough of it, right? His concern is not like, he's not developmental because we don't know he's good. He's developmental because we just haven't seen him play enough, like as much as you want to be comfortable with it. But he's got all the skill set and his tape's pretty good in a difficult conference. Um, I like Mims. I think he's I think he's very good. And then I'm just sort of trusting that that what I've seen so far is not misrepresentative of what he is. I mentioned 803 career snaps, career high of 385 in 2022. Last year, played 297 snaps. He's got a pretty good uh, 81 pass blocking grade last year. He gave up one hurry yeah. in that time. Yeah, I get it. I mean, just over six games right. plus, basically. Um, so, yeah, there are just some question marks for Mims. But he's 6'8", 340, 36-inch arms. Um, he never ran that historic three-cone that we thought – or uh, shuttle that we thought that was, that was fake – but either way, an absolute monster. And he was in Cincinnati the other day for a visit. Yeah. Which means in the same city the other day, we had Orlando Brown Jr., <laughs> we had Trent Brown, we had Amarius Mims, and, you. and me. Yeah. I was the fourth biggest person in the city At least. the other day because of Mims. Yeah. At least that we know of. That's a lot of people. A lot of size. That's a, that's a lot of size here. That would be an interesting Bengals first round pick if they got Mims. Now, think about this too. Bengals sitting there at 18. Yep. And you have Trent Brown on a one-year contract. You have Mims, who we're saying is a developmental tackle to maybe sit behind him for a year. Is this the year for Cincinnati you know, to, to make the longer-term play on the offensive line for Joe Burrow that could, and, could be a nice fit there? And that would potentially snipe Pittsburgh, who have been a common Amarius Mims That's the Yeah, the AFC North generally. And, uh, again, later on the show, Ramon will criticize us or uh, accuse us even of being Cincinnati homers. So we will balance that out and say, Mims, future Steeler, you know, Steeler target here, not just a Bengals target. But I think in that, that 15 to 25 range for Mims, for a team that, uh, that needs that developmental tackle, I think he's, he's probably a good fit there. All right, so uh, Mims is six on the board. What about Fontenot from, from Washington? He's Again, fun. Three on the PFF board. Trevor loves him. I like him a lot. I, I'm not. I'm not as big. I'm not as high on him as Trevor is. Um, he's an interesting player because you look. You, you turn on the tape and he does genuinely look like a guard. Like just from body shape, 
standpoint, it's like somebody has taken a guard and is forced to play him at left tackle because of an injury or something, right? But then he shows up and measures out like a tackle, albeit a, a slightly shorter tackle at what, 6'3", 6'4", uh, instead of you know 6'7", 6'8", that some of these other guys are. Um, his, he's good. He's hyper aggressive. Like you see, you know, you see those the old line guys on Twitter love this this buzz term of like pass protection isn't passive. You know, where they yeah. show all these clips of guys like burying somebody from the side on these on pass protection. You know, the looking for work thing where there's nobody over you. Quick, find another guy and then bury him in the ribs, right? Yeah. And they're like, pass protection isn't passive. But yeah, it's a, love that stuff. It's the big yeah, thing. They love that. Offensive guys love that. Fontenot plays every rep like that. He's going looking to hit somebody, even when sometimes it's not smart. You should actually, you should be a little bit more passive sometimes. Um, but it means it's kind of fun to watch his tape because he's he's going after I people. I think he, he kind of run blocks like that too. Like he's trying to, yeah, he's trying to kill people even right. in the zone game, and he'll like he'll fall off blocks a little bit more than you'd like. But right, um, Fontenot is interesting because he remember when I called Tyler Linderbaum a playmaking center. Yes, and the Ravens drafted Linderbaum, and I was like, Dude, they're going to put him in space, and they're going to use his athleticism, and I, I kind of got those vibes for Fontenot. And then I'm thinking the the team that he gets uh, mapped with quite a bit is the Dolphins, and I'm thinking if he's a Dolphin, and I don't know if you, if he's going to stick a tackle, or you're going to make him a guard, and the Dolphins again could be a great fit because he could step in, play left guard, and be your Teron Armstead insurance maybe at left tackle, but I could see a team that wants to you know run those toss sweeps, get you know get uh, get your playmakers out in space. Get Fontenu out in space because he is so good at moving. Flies out of a stance. Um, he he creates angles in the uh, outside zone run game. Unbelievable at creating angles, getting into position. And so I think he's a. I think he might be a run game weapon. Fontenu as a guard or a tackle. So I think you have to lean into that. Again, he will. He'll have some negatives, right? He'll whiff on some blocks. He'll miss some stuff. Um, I think he's pretty good in pass pro. But from a run game perspective, I think he could be a guy for a team that's trying to get to the perimeter, a guy that you can use, get out into space and, and create some big plays. Yeah, and I also think you can probably dial back that aggression a bit. Like he's hyper aggressive right now and it does get him into some trouble because he'll overextend or he'll just, you know, he'll whiff effectively trying to kill a guy on a block. I think you can probably scale that back a bit, you know, and just say, hey, love the aggression, you know, maybe just, just tap the brakes a bit, you know, just, just a little bit. Because that's probably easier than the other way around, right? Where a guy is way too passive and you're like, come on, I need more. I need more aggression. I need more mean out of you. Like, he's got that. It's just getting him into a little bit of trouble sometimes. I, I probably, I think I prefer that than the opposite. Well, Sam, it's important to me that the supplements I take are of the highest quality. And that's why for the last few years, we've been drinking AG1 here on the PFF NFL podcast. Unlike many supplement brands, AG, AG, AG1 conducts relentless testing to set the standard for purity and potency. AG1 is constantly searching for how to do things better. At 52 iterations of their formula and counting, their team is always trying to find better ways to source, test, and aim to find the best quality ingredients available. AG1 is researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists with decades of experience in their respective fields. So many people have asked me if AG1 is actually the real deal, and trust me, there's a reason why we've been drinking it for so long. So quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword, it's a commitment. Backed by expert-led, scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. So we partner for AG1 for so long because they make a high-quality product that we genuinely look forward to drinking every single day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try AG1, get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription over at drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. Um, who else to discuss here? Oh, so the last guy in the first round is Tyler Guyton. Um, where would you put Fontenu, by the way? Where would you? Position-wise? Yeah. I'd keep him a tackle. So, and he's, all, he's tackle five on the consensus board, tackle three for PFF. Where would he be for you? Uh, Ish. Four? Like, you okay with that range, four, five, six range? He'd be ahead of Latham and behind everyone else, wherever that puts him. Four, five? Perfect. Where does that put him? One, two. Tyler Guyton at 30 on both the PFF five. board and the consensus board. He'd be my top, he'd be my fifth OT five. Guyton is the developmental tackle prospect. Yes. Of this draft class. Remember we had Jim Nagy on the on the show right before the senior bowl and he said Tyron Smith. Remi you know, size, movement skills and the whole thing with Tyler Guyton. Production wise, certainly not there. Even at the senior bowl you saw 
both elements of of the good and bad of Tyler Guyton. Unbelievable when it looks right, and really ugly when it doesn't look right. And that, that's it, that you could say, oh, that's that's every tackle. But like Guyton, legitimately rep to rep, the consistency is just not there. Yeah. But you could see. You mentioned the offensive line coaches and everything. You could see if you have a good offensive line coach that has a history of developing tackles. You could see how Tyler Guyton might be really attractive for some teams. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can if he just hits the upside of what he's capable of, and by that I mean the the good reps. Not even like, hey, maybe if we find these good reps from somewhere, like there's the good is there on tape. We just need to get him doing that all the time. If you get that, you end up with a, a tackle as good as anybody in this draft. It's just the question of whether you can get him to that. That is a big concern for me. And I just hate, you know, like he's being talked about as someone that, that could get drafted in the first round. I mean, good luck to him, but I would hate to draft somebody like that in the first round. That, that level of projection in the player I'm looking for in the first is just terrifying. Yeah, he's uh, like the foot. You know, I mentioned with Foshnu, like when 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 Foshnu screws up, I was like, oh, it's uh, it's on him. I feel like his footwork was just off, and like that was literally like a handful of times, right? That I was noticing that with with Guyton, it, it it legitimately play for play. So, I mean, for me, that the production he's he's got a production red flag, right? Things that historically don't translate. So I'm not I'm not. This isn't in my risk wheelhouse personally, right. Guyton. Don't love so. It. I would not want to be the team that took Tyler Guyton, but I get it. And, yeah. And I, I get it for teams that, uh, you know, if he ends up in the second, I don't know where the Browns pick, but if the Browns, oh, they don't have Bill Callahan anymore, sorry. But like teams that have a Bill Callahan, the teams that have. I mean, the Titans. The ti- <laughs> I mean, the Titans could do it, but I, I mean, with Tennessee, they need, they need sure things. They also need both tackles. They I do mean, need both tackles. So maybe on the turn, you know, take two tackles and one of them's Guyton and you're going to develop them. I get it, but I wouldn't be the team that would want to to maybe do that yeah but the other thing is though I, the the reason like there are what five guys that i'm comfortable with a tackle in terms of i'm getting a good player here the sixth yeah. i have concerns about the seventh at that point if you're if you still need a tackle and those six are gone i mean this at least gives you this, this looks like the other six it's just there's bad in there as well right so I get why people like this get drafted there. It's just... I wouldn't take it that high. It's just I think there's such a big gap between those guys that are good consistently and the guy who, when he's good, looks the same but is bad quite a lot more often. Like yeah. that... And, I, and it's a it's a big assumption to just assume you can bridge that gap. Yeah, I would feel much better about the top four. I mean, I'll throw Latham in there too. I'll trust the numbers for a little bit. Alt, Fuaga, Fashnu, Latham, and Mims. I would say I trust the most. Fontenot kind of on the border. I think you can get there and, and use him in certain ways. The other wild card in the first round is Graham Barton, who's been described as a five-position player. Jim Nagy wanted to put him at center at the Senior Bowl, played left tackle at Duke. Most people have him as a guard, and he just had an incredible workout over at Duke. He did. I don't really – I don't see the five positions for him. I think he's an interior player of some description. Pick your favorite interior spot. That's where he's playing. I don't think he holds up a tackle in the NFL. Do you? Um, it's another one I would try it. I, the tape's okay from a tackle perspective. I do think he ultimately is probably a guard, though. I don't think. I mean, I generally I'm generally I agree that those guys are worth the sh- like. Give him a chance to fail a tackle before you move him inside. Fontenot. Um, Skaronsky, I would have given that opportunity to. I'd still give Skaronsky that shot. I feel better about Skaronsky a tackle than, say, Barton. Right. Yeah. Somebody as special as Quentin Nelson, I'd even think about kicking him out before I kept him inside a guard. But for somebody like Graham Barton, like I don't think the tape a tackle is good enough that you keep him a tackle. Yeah, I think I think Barton was kind of beaten for speed a little bit too much. Yeah. And it's not like he's a length guy either. He's got just under 33-inch arms, so right. he doesn't have your classic tackle tools. Like he's been a he's been a solid college tackle. If right. I'm if I'm giving a guy with guard physical uh physical um makeup a chance to play tackle, it's cuz he was special in college at tackle. I'm not giving yeah. him a chance to stay there just cuz he was reasonable. Yeah. So I'm with you overall. I'd rather have Barton on the interior. His workout, by the way, just from uh model perspective one of the best we've seen that i've seen in my numbers that project to production right so not just what is that what are we looking for i don't have it in front of me i'm just telling you it was 99th percentile okay i'm just curious what numbers we're actually interested in for 
Um, so it's mostly shuttle and three cone okay. are probably the, the highest correlation to success. But the way this works, like arm length isn't a big deal. You know, a lot of the other things are, are pretty much a wash. But the, all the movement stuff, 40, 40, 10, and 20, and uh, the change of direction shuttle and three cone are probably the, the most important thing. And Barton was good in all of those things. So all that projects pretty well to production, whereas arm length is essentially a wash. Right. And, you know, so that didn't work against him. So he's got a good profile for project. For, he's got a good athletic profile for projecting at the next level. Okay. Uh, anything else we want to talk? Tackle-wise, I mentioned Jordan Morgan being 35 on the consensus board. I kind of like Morgan. I think he's fine. Sua Mataya from yeah, BYU. I mean, there's those guys. Once we get into any of these guys, I just – they all start hitting that like <laughs> developmental project button. That I just I'm they not. all are, and so the so here's here's the other little insight that I'll give here with the tackles. We'll kind of fly through the interior offensive linemen, then throw it to Ramon. Yeah. Sound good? Mm -hmm. um, the the two other names I wanted to mention: Roger Rosengarten from Washington, currently 132 on the consensus board, and we've seen him in late first mocks by Mel Kiper. So I don't know if that means. Mel's onto something. He knows. Um, uh, Caleb McGarry made a similar move from Washington, right? McGarry? Yeah. Uh, made a similar move, right tackle from Washington, just like Rosengarten, a couple of years ago, when McGarry was a third round prospect by all you know media reports. And all of a sudden, very late in the process, it was like, hey, Caleb McGarry could go in the first round. So I don't know if that's one of those things with Rosengarten. I don't necessarily see a first round prospect, but if I can get him around 132. I'm happy with Rosengarten. I think he's a developmental type of tackle. He's played a lot of football, but I think he's a, he has the chance to be a good, solid NFL right tackle. Um, the other one, I would say Javon Foster from Missouri. He's a little bit lower on the consensus board, 139. I think he's got very good upside from a run blocking perspective, things to clean up from a pass pro perspective. But if we're talking like the mid-round guy, if these guys are around in the middle rounds, yeah. And I want to get him in the building, and they could be future starters. I'm looking at Rosengarten from Washington, Javon Foster from Missouri as my top guys. The other guys that would get some, like Matt uh, Goncalves, Goncalves from Pittsburgh. Like last year they had uh, the other Pittsburgh guy <laughs> that went in the fourth round to the Jets was like one of the worst guys I had seen from a model perspective. Yes. Kind of similar. So it's, it's like the season where like the mid-round tackles are doing 15 – top 30 visits and everything to me there's only a handful i think that have a a chance to maybe pan out and become starters yeah i mean generally i it, this this offensive line crisis in the nfl is because i think so many of these so many guys you're looking at in the mid rounds are fitting this profile of they have the physical tools they have the athleticism they've got the traits you want to be High level NFL starters, but they they're not they're not playing the same systems. They're not asked to do the same things. They don't have NFL path sets necessarily. They don't have the technique yet, and there's there's no way of getting them that. The pathway isn't there. They're not playing enough. They don't have the practice time. They don't have the preseason time necessarily. Unless you're shuttling them off to the UFL now, like where are they getting that time to get to where they need to go? Unless you have you know, a Stoutland or a Callahan or whoever is your offensive line coach, and there aren't many of those guys. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give you the last, the last numbers on tackles here. Where are you getting starting tackles from since 2015? Of first-round picks, 87% become starters. Only Now, by these numbers, a, a third of those guys become good players, right. solid players. 87% starters in the first. 61% in the second. It's down in like the high 20s, 30%. So you're getting your starters in the first and second round to tackle, and it's a good year to at least get guys that are starters that could project and, and get better over time here. So my if I was my mid round sleeper guy, if I was taking one, would be Patrick Paul from Houston. Yeah, I mean my old consensus board had him in the second. He's dropping a little bit. I agree. I mean if Patrick Paul is a third rounder now for whatever reason, he's, he's very tall. He's long. It kind of works against him sometimes from Houston, but I would... He has a vaguely similar profile yeah. to Fashnu, so I'm at least consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I like Patrick Paul. He's fine, too. He would be the guy that if I was... If I didn't get one in the first round, I still needed somebody that I thought had, you know, high-end starter potential, I, he'd be the guy I took. A lot of the other guys for me are like 20th percentile model guys, and they just don't have a... They don't have a great history. All right, let's fly through some, some IOL, interior offensive linemen, guards and centers... 
uh, the two the two first rounders on the consensus board: Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon and Graham Barton from Duke. We already talked about Barton. Jackson Powers Johnson, we've talked a lot about on this show. Uh, I do think he's a first round center. He's he's unique as a center, as an absolute monster who can move people. We don't see many of these guys come out, and I think he's definitely the clear clear top center in the league in the draft right now. He's um, square, like physically, as a body yeah, type. I love it. It's bizarre. How can you get ba- how can you get past him? I I just can't think of too many people that are shaped that way. Like he's he's so wide. It's good insane. shape. He's got good shape. But like you see, you know, I've seen offensive linemen or large humans that are just fat or just, you know, but he's just he's like a box. He's built like a box. It's bizarre. Yeah. But it does mean there's again, kind of like JC Latham, there's a lot to get around if you're trying to, you know, maneuver inside. Couldn't take my eyes off him at the senior bowl. Because of the body type and everything, and yeah. he had a pretty good senior bowl. Then got hurt, took off. Right, um, but he is uh, he moves people now. Again, yeah. scheme wise, if you're running inside zone, gap scheme generally, like any sort of like if you're running duo a bunch and you're going to have him, you know, double team and getting to the second level and just creating space, he's your guy. If you're running outside zone, don't see it as much. But man, if you're running a downhill yeah. run scheme, and he's a good pass protector too, I think he's he's the type of guy that can handle your 340 pound nose tackle. Yep. And um, much like going back to the Dewan Jones thing, Jones thing, it's just tough to get around him because he's square, as yeah. you said. Um, so pass pro, he's good. But if you have a downhill run game, Jackson Powers Johnson is the guy. His combo, another blocks. perfect stealer. Yeah. For what his they combo want. blocks are really fun because a lot of people, you know, the center just kind of tiny little shove just to make sure the guy is sort of seated on the block right and then yeah. he's headed through the next level jackson powers johnson will like chuck his shoulder into it and not just like he's not just seating that guy he's blasting the dude you know a yard to, to the other side and giving the guard not just the block but giving him leverage as well like he moves that guy with that initial uh chip on his way through to the second level yeah i love it so i'm a i'm a big fan of his i think i think he's the clear to me he's the clear top center uh, beyond that, number three on the consensus board is Zach Frazier, center from West Virginia. Four is Christian Haynes, more of a guard from UConn. And then Cooper Beebe, a guard from Kansas State. Uh, P- Beebe's up at 67 on the consensus board. I know Trevor's lower on him. Trevor he's much lower on the – for some reason. He's, on the, he's gotta, low on the PFF board. I call out Trev for that. Call him out. I mean, on the show, we need to get him on. Be like, dude, what is happening? Um, I like – I like BB. I do as well. He's played a lot of football at Kansas State. All Thousands over the place. of snaps of ball. All over the place as well. Um, Zach Frazier just got an email about him today. People are upset about his grades. At least one person is. Um, pass protection issues for us, some snapping issues. I think he's fine. He's a solid prospect. I know he's getting late first round hype. I think uh, Frazier's profile, I don't think, is nearly as strong as uh, JPJ's. Um, Christian Haynes at guard, I think he's completely different from Cooper Beebe. You know, Haynes is your zone blocking guard, moves unbelievably well. He's a little undersized. Zone scheme, though, if you're talking about, you know, talking about the Dolphins and your Shanahan schemes and your classic old school zone schemes, Haynes is your guy, like 98 Bronco type of guy. Right. That's him. But Beebe is more of a power player, downhill, run scheme guy. But he had a whole season at left tackle. He, where he his, held his own with his 31-inch arms in his as well. He's played career, well. Yeah, in his college career, he has 716 snaps at left tackle. He has 1,631 snaps at left guard. He's got 19 snaps at right guard. He's got 476 snaps at right tackle. That guy has played four different positions on the offensive line. And in multiple seasons, he's played multiple positions during the year. like just And in, inside of games as well. It's bizarre. He's played all over the line and was good at all of it. Like... Those, most of those snaps occurred across essentially three seasons, and in those three seasons, his grade was almost identical and consistently good as both a run blocker and a pass protector, despite moving around like that. Like we talk all the time about how unfair it is to be moving linemen all over the place, and that's generally just from like one spot to another. Yeah, he's moving at three different positions sometimes during the same game, and it doesn't do it. There was any a lot harm. of times in games where Kansas State had him playing left guard, right tackle. You know, tight end, like in moving the first, around all the time. In the first three games of this season, he almost equally split his snaps between left guard and right tackle. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, that wasn't, you know, remember Mackay Becton in the old uh, Petrino right. scheme used to flip strong, strong yeah, well, and they weak used to tackles play like, and everything. Right. They right. used to play like strong and weak side tackle, and they would flip depending on what the play was, which itself always struck me as tremendously stupid. But 
was something that they did. This is, it, I mean, you can at least see some shred of logic for tackle one side or the other, but this is left guard and right tackle. It's different positions and different alignments. It's crazy. So BB reminds me of um, I, those things always get me. I always I have some weaknesses, Sam. One of them is uh, reach blocks is from center. Mm. If I see a good reach block from a center, John Michael Schmitz, oh my gosh, I'm like, Garrett Bradbury, love him. Do you want to defend your John Michael? Because you, know, you were very high on him last year, and he was he was terrible year one. Yeah, it doesn't look good no. so far. But. Though, though I was doing some research, mm -hmm. John Michael Schmitz, what did I love about him? Zone blocking center, right? Yep. Unbelievable reach blocker. You, know, you steal a gap in the outside zone scheme. And I did a little research yesterday. The Giants centers use the fewest reach blocks of any team in the league. It's almost like they put him in position to fail. There you go. Because he's not a power player. Like they're letting, they're trying to have him play like Jackson Powers Johnson. You know, that's just, why John Michael Schmitz just not putting him in a struggled position. as a rookie. I mean, pass pro was ugly as well. Um, not putting him in a position to succeed. Really quick for BB though. Remember Isaac Sayamalu? Yeah. When he came out from the Eagles, and he was, and he was uh, from Oregon State. He was one of the better pass protecting guards we've ever seen, and he also did time. At left tackle. Did time. Did time. He played at left tackle as well and held his own at left tackle. I have a soft spot for the guard who shouldn't be playing tackle in college right. or in the NFL, and it. he goes out and holds his own. So BB reminds me a little bit of Sayamalu through that lens, and I think BB's got one of the better pass-protecting profiles we've ever seen for a guard as well. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely – you can't you can only see it as a positive, right, that he's demonstrated that kind of versatility at the college level, yeah. never been exposed regardless of where they put him. Despite quite obviously, I mean, whatever about Fontenot having a sort of slightly deceiving body shape when you look at the tape. I mean, BB is quite obviously a guard and yet was playing tackle for serious periods of time and looking good. Um, so I'm a, I'm a BB fan. I like, I like Christian Haynes from UConn. Uh, Dominic Puni from uh, Kansas moved around a little bit. I think he's getting some late buzz. He's up to 85 on the consensus board. I think he's got some some versatility. Christian Mahogany from Boston College, more of a power guard. You got the two Christians, one's Haynes, one's Mahogany, different types of players. The 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 accent just just rushed to the surface there with What'd Boston. I do? When he said Boston, it was like Boston. Boston. You can't say Boston. There's no Boston accent for Boston. Of course there is. Nah. There's no Oz in there. There's 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 no Oz. Boston people say Boston different to the rest of us. I don't know. But uh trying to get yeah i don't have sometimes it comes out yeah i'm just saying just you know, it's like a works wicked hard the second level yeah yeah like when you're listening to somebody play he's a hard piano. worker and uh you know he's just a good guy to have it's just a bum in the locker room you know you listen to somebody play piano and they hit the wrong key oh sometimes yeah sometimes we hit the wrong key yeah, here it's just discordant you just hit every now and again the accent just hits a bum note it's like ah there it is yeah um, so from a depth perspective, and we'll, we'll let um, – Ramon's got some breakdowns on some of the centers and guards. We're going to let him break down some of these guys. Anything else to add here? He's a big Cedric Van Pran he is. fan we'll from Georgia, yeah. the center. Um, so we'll break down some more of those guys uh, with Ramon. But it's another class where you've got, I think, JPJ and Barton projected in the first round. Zach Frazier from West Virginia as a fringe first-rounder. And then everyone else, we're talking, yeah, you know, maybe some late round two and some, you know, round three, four, five. That's where I think the depth is here. It's usually where you want to get your guards and centers. There's always, you know, a handful of guys that you want to take rounds one or two. But yeah, this is the draft where rounds three through five, three through six is where you're going to get your guards and centers. Yep. Sound good? Yep. Um, leave your takes in the chat. Everybody list them. My wit without accent. Well, that's design. I say wit and without. I mean, that is a spoof on how Philly does cheesesteaks. Yes. That is directly based Philly off of that. Wit and without. Mm -hmm. And we say that. That's how we do uh, A-B analysis on the PFF NFL podcast. We say wit without. Yep. All right. You got anything else to add here? No, we got a bounce. Your O-line show. Time to go. We're going to go to Ramon Foster. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. We're just going to end the show right after Ramon. And then we're coming back again on Monday with more PFF NFL podcast. So we'll see you again Monday with uh, Mock Draft Monday. But for now, let's go to uh, Ramon Foster.
All right, we are excited to be joined by our new, our friend, our friend, Ramon Foster, former Steelers offensive lineman. He's in Nashville on the radio talking Titans all the time, but uh, former hater, you know, former PFF hater, as we've mentioned before, Ramon, but it's always, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, I think for the first time here. Man, I'm okay with and call the hater to my face. That makes it even better right there. And I own it because I feel like you guys were haters too. So it was mutual, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wait, what? Your career grades were good. Didn't we always like you? Let me pull this up. Yeah. Hold on a second here. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Call it out, man. Um, there were some discrepancies here and there. And it's always the small things that get offensive linemen. Yeah. So I'm always into that. But uh, you uh, didn't you you yelled at Sam at training camp one time? Is that right on, the, on our training camp tour? Not, not just me. There was we had a you know it was that training camp tour, the big one we did. We had three, four, five guys. I don't know how many we had there, but yeah, Ramon he shouted at us at the side of the field. We're just standing there minding our own business, and Ramon yeah. Foster, actual active NFL offensive guard, just starts calling us out in front of all the people. I did, and I said this: Hey, you guys suck. And yeah. it might not have been in those words. <laughs> no, it was those words. <laughs> it may have been a little bit added at the end of it, too, because, of course, when you're adding in certain things uh, as far as how you judge and view football, um, and specifically the offensive line, you guys know us. We're bitter, okay? We get sent to the furthest part of the practice field every mm-hmm. single day. We're the big guys. When you run past us, people go, move, because we're just, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, just a big group of cows being herded around the field. We get no credit, we get all the blame, and then we have people outside the game telling us, hey, you gave up this sack. And I was like, I know I didn't give up that many sacks, and like, there was no justification. I will say, in the way you guys have have grown PFF and discuss it, um, you elaborate more on the how and the whys. And that was one of my biggest things on why I said that. And uh, the other thing too, is what you guys, Prince, what you guys put into the atmosphere, the biggest judges that we have outside our coaches and um, the ownership is the fans. And if there's something bad that comes out, say, hey, this guy created out bad this week, because of social media and the exposure that you have, they run with that. Not right. realizing that, hey, at our position, as far as offensive line goes, there are 70 plus plays that we have to play. And one or two bad plays can mean a bad grade. Um, but we don't talk about the the 68 other plays that you did well. It's those moments. And the justification of that, to me, was somewhat problematic at the time. And that's the reason I said what I said. How Look, much, we understand. We understand. How much do you think that – so I have come to experience in the last couple of years that Pittsburgh fans are unhinged, like crazy, right? I can't even say a nice thing about Miles Garrett just – doesn't mention Pittsburgh, just Miles Garrett X. Steelers fans are all up in my mentions going insane. Like, how much of your initial sort of, oh, BFF, like, those guys suck, is because the Steelers fans are crazy, and they're taking, like, any nugget that comes out from PFF and doing whatever they want with it. Mine was based off my own personal opinion as far as that goes. <laughs> you know what, what fans, gets you Sam. guys? Is you're based out of Ohio. Ah, well, there's connections there that you guys have. And now think, we are, uh, though. Hang on a sec. L- logistics of where your office is and how yeah. it's operated. That's somewhat, some outside of what you guys do, specifically Pittsburgh, maybe even Baltimore, may say, well, hey, it seems more friendly towards Cincinnati or Cleveland. And that is a thing, too. Of course, the biggest topic I'm sure you guys um got a lot of feedback on social media from Pittsburgh fans was the Miles Garrett win rate. Uh, win, what is it? Win rate that he has. Um, that right there, I think, is where it becomes skewed. Like, okay, it seems like you can paint a certain picture for certain players based off of way it's perceived. Your guys' office is that. Yeah, I mean, our office used to be in England and Ireland and Boston and San Francisco. We used to be all over the place. So I don't think that was that's the other part of it too. Yeah, in the yeah. beginning <laughs> stages of it, it's like those guys aren't even in America judging football. Like, oh yeah, it was. was I, don't, I don't think that was helping. It. it was what? Well, it helped our Bengals bias. We yeah. didn't have, which we don't have anyway. But uh, yeah, it definitely no. didn't help with those ac- uh, those accents and everything. So um, anyway, we're here to talk about the NFL draft offensive line class, and now as Uh, Now, you being in Nashville, talking Titans all the time, of course, the Titans being at seven, 
very much in the mix for an offensive lineman, particularly a tackle. So let's start with the let's start high level because I know you've you've watched the tackles, the guards, and the centers. What are your thoughts overall? positional strength of this class uh, from an offensive line perspective and then maybe the individual positions and then we'll get into some of the players. The strongest groups I think in this uh, draft class for the 2024 uh, NFL draft is is the tackles and centers. I don't think too much of, of the guards. I think they're solid. I think they can be good players and you may have some tackles in this group that may move down to guard also but the initial strength of this group from the top, even I say the, the top tier of the tackles all the way down to going into the second and maybe potentially third round for tackles is still solid. As far as the center goes, I don't know if there will be a first round center. The one that jumps off the board to me potentially being a first round center is probably Jackson's Power Johnson as a guy that you probably say to yourself, I can see a scenario in where a team may be drafting a center mid first round probably in the 20s to the 30s can take a guy like him the guards don't overly impress me they all seem to have a trend of mine that um i'm trying to find out ways to correlate it to their play and how they're actually rated as either second or third round guys but the tackle depth is so deep and i don't think we've seen a group of centers come out like this that are probably day one starters, even in second and third round grades. And like I said, the one that jumps off the the page the most to me is, is probably Jackson Powers Johnson. And of course, you got um, West Virginia Zach Frazier and other guys behind him too. We we've talked to a lot of NFL players or former players, and they often tend to view prospects like through the lens of the way they played the game. So Kurt Warner says openly that you know as he was a pocket quarterback. He believes that. Passing from the pocket is still the way that you play quarterback in today's NFL. So when he's looking at prospects, he's like, who are the best pocket passers here? And then we'll add the other stuff on. Do you look at offensive linemen? Is there something from your game, like this is the way I played, this is what I'm looking for first and foremost, or are you completely sort of divorced from that when you're viewing these guys as prospects? I'm divorced from it it because – The way I look at this situation and me evaluating guys, one, they're probably better athletes than me. I'll be the first one to tell you I was a good athlete, wasn't the greatest. My 40 time wasn't the the best. My benching wasn't the best. I tested bad. So me evaluating talent is looking at guys that are probably better athletes, and I can appreciate that about them because I know what NFL teams are looking for. You don't find many guys sticking around the organization the way I did for 11 years that tested the way I did, that played the way I played, and was very specific in what my strengths were. I think if you guys viewed my strengths, it was if Moan gets guys in the phone booths and stay square to the line of scrimmage, he's going to win. They don't pull. They didn't pull me the way they did David DeCastro. I I also had a, a an appreciation for DeCastro, his mobility, his ability to get to the edge and get to the second and third levels of the defense. But what Dave had an appreciation for me was Dave can hold up the front side blocks to make sure that the guard or tackle pulling on counter runs was his strength. He couldn't do that. Alejandro Villanueva and myself made the left side of the offensive line as strong as you need it for those type of pulls, that type of movement, and our pass blocking was good. So when I evaluate guys, first and foremost, I want to look at what type of athlete he is. What is his strengths? How does he move side to side? Does he move like he's pushing buttons on a typewriter? Or does he move fluid? How is his hips? What is his uh, win, win percentage as far as if he gets beat? Can he recover? Can he redirect? Those are the things I look for. So it's not like me because I understand I am very unique in my style of play. Um, So with guys that I would watch would be like a Jari Evans, big type of dude that gets you in the phone booth and lets wrestle and dance. I look at other dudes who get those Pro Bowl, all all pro billings and say, all right, I can recognize and appreciate the difference. And some of the guys that I see, it, let's say, at the guards this year, because I'm somewhat critical of them, I think, coming out of the draft, I say they got to be in a position-specific division and t- and team to be able to highlight their strengths. To where I see a guy at tackle, which I'm a former college tackle, too, that moved to guard in the NFL, I see an Amarius Mims, who I think potentially may have the highest, I'm talking about potential of this tackle group, but he has a lack of tape. You got to look at the tightrope uh, surgery on the ankle. Um, But I say to myself, his body type, his athletic ability, his size, and just his measurables, he could play the right tackle fluidly or even move to the left tackle fluidly as opposed to a guy like Tali Fuaga, who I see as a primary right tackle. 
Um, when you're looking at left and right tackle, do you have what I would consider some of like the old school bias of like a right tackle has a different, do you think the right tackle has a different job than the left tackle? Or do you think teams are more right-handed? They still want that big mauler at right tackle and they want the best pass protector at left tackle. Or are those jobs uh, converging over the last few years because there's great pass rushers everywhere? I think they are converging over the last few years, but if you talk to people around the NFL, the offensive line coaches or just GMs and people that evaluate it, teams still put right tackles in a box to where a guy like Tyler Fuaga, right, out of uh, Oregon State, you see him and you say, the first thing they say about him, gosh, he's a road grader. Well, you say he's a road grader like he's a guard. No, he's still a tackle. So there are still teams that are looking for guys that play on the right side of the offensive line to be a little bit more physical and less finesse. And I think that's why you put a guy like him specifically on the right side. I also look at a guy like J.C. Latham, where a bigger dude, mobile enough, but I don't think he's mobile enough to play left tackle. So, yeah, I still think there's a separator between the two. Um, but teams have to also realize you can't just put a big body dude at right tackle and say, okay, yeah, we'll live with what happens at the end of the day. You still have to have athletes over there. And I think the fact that you have the Miles Garrett, the TJ Watts, uh, the Michael Parsons, even Von Miller's been doing it for a very long time too, rushing off the offensive right tackle side, you, you got to put an athlete there. And I think that's what's super unique about this group. I don't know if I've ever seen so many 501s, 5-1s, um, 4-9s at the tackle position. And some of these dudes are right tackles. Um, so there has to be a speed and agility and athletic component to drafting these new young guys coming out of college. It, it seems that the longer this draft process goes, the lower uh, everybody seems to be going on Olu Fashnu uh, as, a, as a prospect. I mean, we started off and it was like he might be offensive tackle one. He's right there with Joe Alt. And now... Where he's just sliding further and further down the first round in everybody's mocks. What is your take on Fashnu? So my take on Fashnu is this. Um, I think he has some technique issues, which he's working with Duke Miniweather right now, who's been an O-line guy out of uh, Texas. Um, what, what I have for him is this, man. I think he moves well. He's got really good feet. But he also has new to offensive line feet, it seems like to me. He consistently gives up his left leg, dropping his uh outside leg, which also cuts the corner to the uh off I mean cuts the corner to the quarterback. That is a consistent thing that shows up on his tape. He he has the ability sometimes to give up too much ground. Uh, and then, of course, it's the use of his hands, not his hand size, which became a thing at the combine where he doesn't have super big hands. But he's not necessarily a strong handed guy when he put hands on defensive linemen. He does a double under technique for the most part, it seems like, which exposes his chest, which allows him to get pushed back. And he also seems to get a little bit nervous whenever he has speed guys. Look at the Ohio State tape at times. He seems to start catching up to the defensive end instead of actually setting to a point and attacking them. And anytime he attacks that left leg, I promise you, more times than not, it drops. And that is very problematic. And I, I, and I know that's a coaching thing, too. I will always put pressure on coaches. Coaches are paid to coach. They make you come in a building all the time because they want to coach. That's a technique thing for me when it, when you talk about a guy like Olu Fashionu. Um, but I like him. That's the, Do I think he has high pedigree? Yeah. Um, I think some will probably even label him boom or bust because you see some of his deficiencies show up. Heck of an athlete but at times gives up a little bit too much pressure um, for my, uh, for, for, in, in my opinion. Yeah, when you watched uh, Fashnu, I was watching him the other day against Ohio State, JT uh, Tui, uh, hmm, Tui Malau. I always, I, should, I always try to practice ahead of time, mm. and I didn't. Yeah. JT gave him some problems, but I felt like when Fashnu lost, it was, like, it was his fault. It was like, because I, I felt like he is consistent, his, you know, his kick step is consistent, consistent, consistent. And then what you said, all of a sudden he's rushing, and it's like he's getting all caught up. And it was on him more than JT beating him. And so is that just reps? Is that he's young? That's where I think you look at the potential. It's like, man, if he just if he refines that technique, he does have special pass blocking ability potential. What I like about him is 
Um, 32 inch vertical, so you see his explosion. Really nice body, 6'6", 3'10", 3'12", in that range right there. I love his hips. They're fluid as ever. He moves side to side well, which is, again, why is he getting over anxious into getting to a spot or not getting to a spot? And then, of course, the hand placement is a problem for him at times, too, because it gets wide. I thought for a second that, okay, he gets his hands wide because he knows he can take on a bull rush. And more times than not, the bull rush is somewhat problematic for a guy like him. These are all very coachable, correctable things. Um, when we're when we're dra- when we're we're talking about the draft, though, the draft isn't about us praising you. It's about how much can we break you down to see where we can place you. Right. And when we're separating Joe Alt from Olu Fashionu to me, it really does boil down to the technique, the consistency of play and his ability to finish at times. So I don't know even at his size, you expect a guy like him to finish more often. He doesn't do it as often. Uh, but that to me is that's coaching. He has to be taught. And it's a matter of if you're taking him in the top 10, uh, how much are you willing to give up and sacrifice your franchise quarterback on the backs that you trust that he's going to stop the bull rush or not? Uh, drop his left leg often when it comes down to rushing the quarterback. That's one of the bigger things that offensive linemen have to be comfortable with. Find your spot, get to your spot, and own it. He doesn't own it as well as some of the other guys um, at tackle in this draft. Um, when you're we're, – we're, we're interviewing – we're with Ramon Foster here, and we've already on this show earlier discussed all these players. So I might repeat myself a couple times, but it's funny because <laughs> – um, I know you're a proponent of PFF grades now. I know you're a big fan. So um, I'll give you what we have on Foshnu. One of the best pass blocking grades we've seen historically. One of the worst corresponding run blocking grades, just from like a high level perspective, right? And so when I hear those, th- when I see those things, I think about who are similar players historically. A guy like Laramie Tunsil coming out had really good, better pass blocking than run blocking, say, and just oversimplifying. I um, mean, at the NFL level, David Bakhtiari was a guy who was struggled with the bull rush early on and then became probably the best pass-protecting left tackle once Joe Thomas left. But Bakhtiari was always a better pass protector than run blocker. Are those fair types of comparisons, uh, fair uh, upside you know, type of comparisons maybe for Foshnu? You know why it's fair? Because every single guy you mention is an athlete. Yeah. Every single one of them. Laramie Thompson, I don't know if there's a better athlete that's so comfortable in his stance. When Bakhtiari's when, when Bakhtiari is healthy, there's no better player that's comfortable with what he's doing on the play to play. So comparing him to them is very fair. And again, here's the thing about the progression of almost every pro, but especially in the offensive line. It, it's about year three to year seven is when they start to hit that sweet spot. So the things that I'm knocking him for are things that he should grow with. I think Laramie Tunsil didn't have the greatest. Where was he at? He was also at a guard his first year, yep. if I'm not mistaken, as far as Laramie. So he had time to grow and understand what it takes to be an NFL lineman at a different position. He's just athletic enough that they had to put him on the field, but he was also a left tackle. The thing with Fashion, as you just said, those comps are fair because he is that good of an athlete. If you look at his hips and his core, your soul, and then the footwork is good also it's a matter of small technical stuff and him i'm 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 guessing his nationality is nigerian so he probably didn't start playing football till high school or even later right so you can see what that p word potential is for a dude like him it's a matter of how much potential i mean how much patience do you have and what kind of offensive line coach uh, is going to be his teacher and the quarterback situation too quarterbacks also to are to blame for lack of development at times uh, just on the basis that they get nervous because they got a rookie or they get nervous because, hey, this guy's giving up way too much pressure. That's a factor into the game, too, that, that you can't put on paper, really. Uh, you mentioned Joe Alt from Notre Dame. Is he the top tackle? Is he the guy that the Titans should be looking at at seven? I've been playing this game, this sicko game, this devil's advocate game with this Titans uh, fan base here by saying go defensive because if you got a, a really strong side of the ball with what they've done, um, with the corners that they signed, Chide, uh, Chido Ouse, um, Legereus Snee, you got Big Jeff here, Harold Landry. You name off some dudes, I say, man, go Dallas Turner because that way you can really make the defense strong, right? Get one side of the ball very strong and move from there. Um, but the guy that's the right choice for the Titans, Joe Alt. Everything about him that you're asking him to do is draft 
your franchise left tackle to go play right next to Peter Skaronski. What I have on him is this, man. At 6'9", 321, and I think he actually added muscle or just a little bit of weight um, from where his college weight was to where he ended up at the combine. Ran pretty much a five flat. Um, 28 inch vertical for a guy his size and 27 on the bench checks every single box as far as his height goes. He's a natural low to high type of guy. Um, he's not a real mover in the run game, but I had a scout at the combine. I mean, at the uh, senior bowl tell me, um, size is speed for offensive line. If he's not moving guys the way you need him to, well, his size makes it hard for them to see around him to actually make tackles. And one thing about Joe Alt is this in the run game. He may not be Tally Fuaga, who everybody's craving it, cra- uh, uh, it's just crazy over right now as far as his intensity and nastiness in the run game. But when we're talking about getting his steps, getting to the second level or the first level and covering guys up and moving them, he does exactly that. Uh, real quick pro tip here. In the NFL, it's not many people that just bulldoze guys off the line of scrimmage, right, guys? It's right. a matter of can you cover them up and make a lane for the running back, and he does that often. The passing game is easy. He gets there. He settles in. He uses his arms. He puts his hands on him. It's not a violent punch. It's a assured, let me make sure I can control you type of punch that he has as an offensive lineman. He does, because of his height at times and getting out against shorter, quicker guys, Penn State's take right. Um, it, he he gets behind his skis a little bit too, or over his skis with kicking and getting to a point. But what he has to save him is that six nine frame, the long legs, the long arm, and he doesn't bend. Even though you see him lean, he's not a a, a bender of the waist the way I've seen other guys at that size. So you have Alt as the top. Do you have a do you have a clear tackle too, or is it a lot of like depends on my team and my fit and scheme? How do you break these all down? So who would you say after Joe Alt? I had my top three, and I did this a couple months ago on my radio show here. I went Joe Alt one, Amarius Mims two, Ooh, Mims Olu Fashionu three. Wow, you have a type. You have a, <laughs> What's my type? Left tackle. You, I mean, the, the athletic guys. I mean, you've, you've, you've hinted at it, right? The guys that can move. Uh-huh. You have a little anti-right tackle bias for the big, burly guys, which is good, which is great. I, I, think, I think Sam's question for you earlier, though, not seeing the game through your own playing lens is really important. I think that's good that you don't necessarily do that. Uh, so, so here's the other thing, too. The teams that I cover um, potentially need lefts, so I focus in more on them. Yeah. Not necessarily focus in more on them, but the way I break them down and see them, I am looking for a more athletic guy. I will be honest with you. I absolutely love J.C. Latham and what he can do. I love Tyler Fuaga, too. Very good guys when it comes down to what you're going to ask them to do. But you guys know, like I do, the guys that get the most praise is going to be the left tackle. So the focus of this draft is probably going to end up being left tackle specific. I look at a team like the Chargers who also need, uh, I'll say this, I think Harbaugh is going to get back to running the ball and being physical. It wouldn't shock me to see him go after a uh, strong right tackle, although they need help at wide receiver in a very strong and necessary way. But if you're looking for a bruiser type, I'm I'm all on board for J.C. Lake, Tali Fuaga. Uh, Amarius Mims even playing right tackle for a team or two. Uh, we talked uh, the other day, um, Steve, and Roger Rosengart. Like, he's another dude that that you can say to yourself, right tackles, you can find them in this draft and feel fully okay with plugging and playing them also. Talk, talk about Mims a little bit because he had just an incredible – I mean, he didn't run the, the rumored three-cone, but dude's a monster, moves really well. But just 803 career snaps, and you said something a little while ago. Hey, O linemen don't hit their stride till years three through seven. You'll you'll be happy to know that the PFF data backs you up on that. That you you do see of all positions in the NFL, O line bump in years three and four, which I think yeah. backs up what you probably feel right and what it seems like. It takes these guys some time. How would you handle that with Mims and his his inexperience, and what, what do you see in his game? Man, his biggest blip, as you said, is his lack of tape. Uh, he hadn't played many reps in college for a guy of his his nature. Coming out of high school as a, a former five-star, really All-American, he checks every single box, went to Georgia, of course, and they just put out first-round talent. For a dude like him at 6'8", 340, running a five-flat, 
insanely athletic. I saw him at the combine, and he did not look like he was holding 340 pounds. He's insanely built. Um, I love his hips. I love his footwork. His ability to be nasty on the offensive line was real solid, too. But his body of work as far as pass setting hasn't been there. I saw him do a pretty good job against uh, uh, James Pierce, who's probably going to be a top 10 pick next year in the NFL draft for Tennessee. Um, for I mean, from the Tennessee Vols, watching that tape against a man that's been as solid as you need him. I have for him, sky's the limit for a guy like him. Good body, good bend, long arm, does well in space. I love to see a little bit more nastiness, though, and finish in his tape. You can tell he's a guy that's still figuring out how to play at a high level, but his ability to be taught and be put in almost any offense, I think he can play in the AFC North. I think he can play for a team like Miami. I think he can play for a team like Seattle. You put him in Houston, he's good as gold to me, man. And that's even on a small sample size. And maybe that's because he haven't been hasn't been exposed that much either. But he gets to his set. He's always square. You see guys that have that hip to feet ratio to where it just looks like he's always on solid ground. That's him to me. That's why I also think with watching how he moves and how fluid his hips are. He should be able to train himself to move. If it's in year one playing right tackle, he should be able to move to left tackle flawless. That's the type of athlete that I think he is. How uh, how much coaching do you think can happen in today's NFL? Like how we there's sort of this widespread belief that there's an offensive line crisis almost in the league right now. Part of it seems to be because the guys that aren't starters just don't get the reps to develop, to learn, to actually play, to get better. You know. We've been sort of saying maybe the NFL needs one of these spring leagues to keep working so that they have somewhere to put offensive linemen to get them live reps. But when you're drafting these athletes in the second, third, fourth round, these sort of developmental offensive linemen, how much can an NFL staff actually take this guy who's this athletic ball of clay, but there's technique flaws or just inexperience, and get them to being a high-level starting NFL offensive lineman? Man, that is a great question. Um, when it comes down to the hires that you make and the staff that you uh, uh, that you assemble as a coaching uh, staff, um, and the offensive line not just being, hey, you guys just do your job. Um, I, I, I dealt with that a little bit with one, you know one or two of the coaches that I had in Pittsburgh to where it was, hey, everybody's going to be taught the exact same way, and that's dumb. One of the best things that happened to my career was uh, the hiring of Mike Munchak. Should be in the Hall of Fame as a coach with the way I feel about his play and the way he's extended, guys. What has to be understood, Sam, as you just said, is not everybody's the same. One thing I would say that Munch did, and it comes down to the smarts of the offensive line coach, too. Maybe somebody that's played it. Maybe somebody has been taught by one of those greats. Uh, Bill Callahan being here in Nashville. Uh, Mike Munchak being one of those guys. Philly's got one of those guys. Uh, clearly, Kansas City has one of those guys with what they've done with that offensive line, right? And you got to say to yourself, I can't teach my right guard the same way I teach my left guard. I can't teach the right tackle to do the same thing as the left tackle. There can't be a live by my rules or not type of scenario. And I think that what ruined a lot of careers in the NFL is some coaches come in and think their technique is the check box, is the, 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 the cream of the cream when it comes down to how you teach them. And that's not okay. And you also got to find out what your mode is as a, as a team on what you're looking for from offensive linemen. If you need an athletic guy left tackle, get him. If you need a guy who's a little less athletic and you know he's going to be there and available, you take that dude. I think for a good offensive line too, Sam, you got to have three pieces. You got to have a solid center. You got to give me a left tackle. And you got to give me one more. Every good offensive line in the NFL has three. Team's ability to figure out Okay, this guy might run a slow 40, or he might have a bad three cone, but look at his tape. I don't think enough people look at the tape. We're so excited about what projects can be, but a lot of coaches don't know how to develop projects. The case in point, Tyler Guyton, right? He, he was a big conversation around the NFL pre-draft and, uh, and the senior bowl. But who can actually teach him up? to where he can become a valid starter in the NFL and not just be excited because he's an athlete, former tight end. Right. Like, I look at Tyler Guyton myself out of Oklahoma, and I say to myself, first thing I would do with him is tell him, you got to lower your, your stance. He sits up 
tall in his stance. Not a lot of coaches evaluate that. They just probably look at him and say, well, he's an athlete. He'll get the job done. It's not that simple. Coaches have to coach in the NFL, and I don't think a lot of coaches do that because they're worried about either the game plan or simply getting the ball out on time. And the other component of it, too, is look where they're coming from. Like, I, I'm going to be biased because I played in the SEC, but SEC linemen. You know they're playing against one of the most highly drafted uh, conferences in college football. Some of the best players come out of the SEC every single year. I'm not sure what the numbers are, but I guarantee you there's a gap between the SEC and the other conferences as far as the amount of players that go into the NFL. So look at those linemen right there. Also, look at Michigan. Look at Penn State. Look at Notre Dame. Those are the schools that you say to yourself, they have a history of putting guys out. Iowa, right? And that's where you start and move out from there. And if you're going to go to a small school guy, it ain't the fact that, hey, he looks good. No, how much did he actually dominate? You know, we're, 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 I'm looking at a guy here in Nashville, Dylan Radins, who you guys have graded, and we've talked about a lot at our show here in Nashville, came out as a second-round tackle. I think he's an NFL guard. And you know where Brian Callahan and the Tennessee Titans are putting him now? At guard. You don't have to make guys play a position because you drafted them there. You don't have to also take guys because everybody else fell in love with them. Or it's the idea that, look, sometimes you might go have to have your scouting department find that diamond in a the rough. There's a multitude of ways because there's so many players that come out and there's one of the biggest positions on the field. There's five guys that you got to figure out how it works. If you look at what Philly has, right, they, got, they, had, they have two stud tackles and they just retired the Hall of Fame center. That's your three. And I know they got some really good guards, uh, really good guards. It's rare you find that. But if you look at the offensive lines that are good in the NFL, they got three. Most teams don't understand that you need at least three guys to actually make your group better and good and sustain the level of play. And the other way of doing that, too, is making your guys your guys. You can't go out and buy free agency, free agents when it comes down to offensive line. You can, but it's got to be a situation where you're you're an addition and you're not the main piece because that cohesion and that ability to be a, a, a one unit comes in the summertime when you guys are around each other. It comes when you really go at one another's neck about, hey, that was a trash play by you and I need you to be better. The giving the room to the players is a necessary thing when you're trying to build a culture of sustainability when it comes down to blocking for the running backs and protecting the quarterback. And I think a lot of teams just say, all right, just put the big dudes in front. That's not a way to operate in today's game. I'm too passionate about this. I love it. I love it. I, I want to transition to some of the interior guys, but there's a couple tackle prospects like Grant Barton, Troy Fontenew from Washington, who could play. Grant Barton's been described as a five-position player that he could play anywhere. Fontenew is a guy. A yeah, so where, <laughs> where, where, where do you think these guys are? A lot of people like Barton as a center. Um, where, do you like, where do you like Grant Barton and Troy Fontenew? I like Grant Barton as a, as a, as a guard um, because I think he possesses the athletic ability to be really good in the NFL at guard, not a tackle. And I think putting a football into his hands so soon into the NFL may be problematic for him because that's a hard job to take on. I do think we're about to get to a level in the NFL where, where we are about to go back to big on big, meaning the the, the smaller guys are probably going to take a little bit of a back seat and it's going to be more of a run game in the NFL. So I'd much rather see him be good at what he does than that's ball out of his hand, moving guys around when it comes to his specialty. Because you look at his tape, he moves the entire side of the ball sometimes. I mean, the entire side of the defensive line sometimes. I love that about his game. He has a little bit of lean in his push at times, but his footwork is good. He moves side to side well enough. He just leans a little bit sometimes uh, that gets him in trouble. I love the way he moves, though. When it comes to Troy Fontenot, I can't say enough things about him. Yes, he's a little bit shorter than the other 6'3", 317, but quick. He is fiery. Um, he has the ability to punch. The thing that'll get him is he is somewhat over-aggressive at times, um, and it puts him in bad situations. But you never have to worry about who's starting the fight when it comes to Troy Fontenot. He is starting to fight every single time. Uh, I put down very technical from what I saw. Um, I saw him spin on tape one time. I saw DN spin on him, and he spun with the defensive lineman just to get back in front of him. That takes... 
guys, I, that takes some cojones to do that. Do you understand me? You don't put me out there and say, if he spin, you spin. That's never been my specialty, okay? <laughs> That's a different type of athlete, man. Um, but his tape shows he's not much of a leaner. He just gets in trouble because he's over aggressive at times. And that's probably because of his size. Um, they pull him left and right. He gets down the field and he's very thorough. And anytime he's free, go look at his tape. He's looking to clean up a defensive tackle every single chance he gets. He is an aggressive guy. I had a friend of mine tell me, uh, who's anti, he's a Baltimore fan. He said, I'm hoping people don't see him because that's the type of tackle that Cincinnati needs. And I was like, yep, I could see a guy like Troy Fontenot going to the Cincinnati Bengals, especially with what they got going on with Orlando Browns Jr. contract soon, trying to figure out what happens with him. I do think he'll need a little bit more time um, to grow and learn how to be a pro. But there's one thing that I was taught in the, uh, when I first came into the league as a rookie. If you can fight, they're going to find a way for you to stay on the field. And one thing about Troy Fontenot is he is going to fight every single play. His finish is good. Would you keep him at tackle, or do you think you could see him maybe playing guard or tackle or you know guard for a year, transitioning later? I see him as a tackle. Okay. I just do. Uh, he's... I'm going to say it again. It's probably a, a, a crutch of mine. He's athletic enough to play in the NFL at tackle. That's not a crutch. That that matter. I mean, that matters at tackle, obviously. That's not – Yeah. I mean, that, that stuff absolutely matters. I um, think he's athletic enough. Um, as Cincinnati Bengals fans over here, that's good to hear. That would be a good fit because <laughs> we're, we're biased to the Bengals. So always, <laughs> always rooting for the best for our Bengals. Um, you mentioned the deep center class. I'll let you break that down. Jackson Powers Johnson – He's an absolute monster. Do you also see this around the NFL? Do you think the NFL is looking for bigger centers? Uh, there's some rumblings around the league that they're looking for bigger, stouter centers rather than some of the undersized guys. I, I love Aaron Brewer. I call him the modern marvel at 270 pounds. But, man, it does feel like the NFL wants um, some bigger dudes at center. You, you know why? It, I, I, this is a conspiracy of mine. Your crowd and you guys are welcome to tell me I'm wrong, but I think it's just because of the price of the pass catcher and the pass thrower has gone up so high. You got to get to a point to where you balance it out. The league works uh, the opposite direction sometimes. Um, whenever it comes down to the running back being the focal point, they went exactly to the quarterbacks. Uh, and with that, the offensive line got small. These 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 prospects are coming out so big right now, so athletic that you have to go back to those dudes. Look at Georgia's offensive line, or Texas, or Ohio State. Almost all these, or Michigan, almost all these dudes are about 320 or more. 6'4", 6'5", 6'3", here and there, but they are big and athletic, and when it comes down to Jackson Powers Johnson, I was shocked to see a guy his size at the Senior Bowl move the way he did. Um, He's an anchor. Um, he's a dude that I saw move side to side, and I think he was uh, trying to overprove himself that he was either in shape or athletic enough to play the position at the senior bowl. Every single time he snapped the ball and they were blocking, he was 5, 10 yards down the field. Um, his side to side was good. His pin and pull was really good. Um, and then he didn't have many issues either when it comes down to his play at Oregon. I like him. I think he's center number one in this year's draft. Uh, a team that I cover, if they were looking for a center, the uh, Steelers at 20, I'd take a chance with a guy like him at 20. If I can hold him off to the second, I would. But I think there's a team that will jump up for Jackson Powers Johnson for sure. How big of a gap do you think there is between him and the rest of the class? I think it's significant because of his size and his ability to move. You don't see what what did he weigh in? Three twenty plus. Yeah, yeah. And, he's and huge. move the way he does, and uh, he has this bounce about his step that I don't think you see from guys his size. And knowing that uh, in today's game, where Aaron Donald just retired. But you got so many other guys, the Chris Jones, uh, um, um, DeForest Buckner, Jeffrey Simmons, and the list goes on around these D tackles that are pushing the pocket. I think a lot of defenses have realized, hey, look, the tackles have gotten better and more athletic, or they found better ways to protect. So the best way to attack offenses in the NFL these days is up the middle. 
And that's where a guy like Jackson, Jackson Powers Johnson goes into play or watching Creed Humphreys in Kansas City do what he does, a bigger offensive lineman playing center, right? Like those are the things that you're looking for. And I'm a huge fan of him. Um, it, his tape is not bad. His deficiencies may be what? His size, that he'll have to make sure that he keep in check here and there because people who are big like that, usually have that issue here and there strength is there speed is there size is there and his ability to play the position at a high level is there considering what he did in college who else do you like among the centers in this class then i'm higher on cedric Van pran than others are i think the number two at that position is probably zach frazier but i'm higher on cedric Van pran um fluid hips um is he a little bit shorter yeah He's got a big lower body, man, that I love. Um, when you see him get to the second level, he doesn't seem nervous. Hand placement is solid. Um, I think he may be a tick slower than what you want him to in his movement sometime, but he's not problematic at all with the way he set and the way he combo blocks up the middle. Um, from my understanding, the people that have talked to coaches around him, super smart. He's a field general that you want. If you have a veteran quarterback that want to – Delay some of the responsibilities to him. He can pick that up. But he's also a guy, if you got a young quarterback, that they can learn and grow together. I think, to me, he could be a day one starter at that position to where you still get him in the second or third round. I like him. Um, been an anchor for that offensive line in Georgia for a little while while he's watched everybody else go first and second round off that offensive line. I think he's next up. Um, any other centers to highlight before we get to the guards? Easily Zach Frazier. Yeah. The only issue I have with him, only issue, is I think he brings his his uh, wrestling tactics onto the field a bit too much. You see him hipping folks and throwing people to the ground to where in the NFL, the referees can't wait to call that a penalty. That's going to end up being a holding on him. Uh, he uses that strength, but it's also one of his strong suits too. His leverage and hand movement and or hand placement and his ability to get under guys and maneuver around um, is a huge bonus for him other than the finish of it. He can't in the NFL start hipping folks because that's going to end up either getting one of his teammates hurt or getting penalties in the offense. But uh, uh, started day one, I think, as a freshman, one of the first guys to do that at West Virginia for a while. He has the reps, he has the knowledge, uh, and he has the athletic ability too to be able to snap, get in space, snap, set back, or snap and run block at the line of scrimmage. He is one of those sure fits, I think, that will need some supporting cast, but considering he's coming out of West Virginia where they're not really known for offensive linemen and he is to be what he's, uh, what they're projecting him to be in the NFL, I think speaks very, high, very highly of what he's going to be capable as a starter. Those are my top three guys when it comes down to uh, centers. And I'd probably go Jackson Powers, Johnson, Cedric Van Pran, Zach Frazier. And then you mentioned you don't love the guard class as much as tackle or center. How would you break that? If you're calling Graham Barton a guard, who else are maybe – is the NFL looking at rounds two and three? Who else do you like at the guard position? Man, it's, it's Cooper Beebe, of course. Christian Haynes and Christian Mahogany, I think, are some of the top guys when it comes down to this group. Uh, Christian Haynes, I think, is number one. The issue that I had with Christian Haynes was this for me. Um, or where did I have it in my notes? Oh, he gets knocked back a good bit in the run game. Straight ahead, he's solid. If you look at him go side to side, he's losing ground often in the run game, and that's problematic, especially at the guard position for a guy like him. Needs a little bit more knee bend, um, but he's always 100% on every single play. He finishes almost every single time. Long arms, good side-to-side -side movement in short space, but he's a guy that's – when he's going outside to the right or outside to the left, he gives up a, a, a good bit of ground consistently. And that's something that can be coached or maybe his strength coming from UConn. Um, I don't know what the strength the program is like, um, but he's a guy that you know is smart, long arms, and he uses them often, I think, to get back in good position, which, again, may speak about his footwork in small spaces, although he ran, again, a five flat. It's not correlating one way or the other, um, but – it's a bonus of his. Like I said, needs a little bit more knee bend and just a little bit of of, of, of strength at the line of scrimmage, taking that point of contact. 
Love it, Ramon. We could talk go line all day with the Ramon. We could, you are passionate uh, about it. I love it. The other Christian, by the way, I ain't yeah. mean to take you take no, you off. Ahead. The other Christian man, Christian Mahogany out of Boston College. His tape is very fascinating to me, man. Um, be, because he ran a 5-1, uh, 32-inch vertical, 32-and-a-half-inch vertical, which shows he has the explosion. Explosion. He has a sprinter-style stance to me where that right leg goes back kind of far. I wonder, was he a former college, I mean, former high school tackle? Uh, my, my leg went back further, I think, either because of my size or because I was a former uh, college tackle. But he has that, though. He has a quick first step. But he steps under himself a lot. I think he needs an adjustment to his stance, which is, again, that's a coaching thing to me. Uh, but he's a straight line blocker more than he is a side to side blocker to me. He can't get into space, but the way I look at him is um, he's looking to fight often, which will also get him in trouble, which also says he has to get comfortable, more comfortable with playing on the interior. Not a bad tape, not a bad specimen, but again, if I'm ranking the groups, I put the guards last because of that. I think they have um, some deficiencies that the tackles and centers don't have. He's a little bit of a leaner, and, and again, I think he's somewhat still getting comfortable with playing guard um, just by looking at his tape. And I can be completely wrong on him, but he's an athlete, runs fast, and has some of the intangibles that you like. Uh, those guards, the, the Christians there, Haynes is currently number 59 on the consensus board, so expected to go in that second round range. Christian Mahogany expected to go in the third round range at, at currently at number 92 on the consensus board, just for some perspective. Cooper Beebe, who you mentioned from Kansas State, 68, so somewhere in that second, third round range for him. So, so He's unique to me, Cooper Beebe. Because he's been talked about a lot, and talk is just that until somebody drafts you. He's a big body dude, 6'5, 322, um, five flat, 27 and a half inch vert. I look at those things because it tells me his speed and his explosion. Does he have them? Right. Uh, the, the issue with him was shorter arm dude, right? For offensive linemen, but he, short arm guys usually rep out a lot. He only got 20 reps on the bench. Now, benching is one of those things I always dismiss because I got long arms. I always made an excuse for it, right? Same. But short arm dudes, I never make an excuse for. So I, I'm going to give him a little bit of grace because he weighed in at about 322. I don't know what he was pre-draft, right? So I think he may have either been focusing on weight loss and potentially speed and not really strength when it comes down to his pre-draft or pre-combine workouts. Um, he has a little bit of a stiffness to his play. But he's a mauler, don't have much grace, uh, and he's a straight-line athlete also when you're talking about what you will ask him to do. He did pull a little bit at Kansas State. He can get in space, but I wouldn't trust it over the top. I look at him as a, a run-first type of a guard um, as opposed to his pass pro more than anything. Again, with his size, he gets the job done when you're asking him to, hey, I need you to go move a mountain. He'll do that for you. It may just look stiff at times as opposed to, um, let's say, Christian Haynes at times or one of the guards. Like it's, it's just a little bit stiffer at times. Well, I love it, Ramon. Love talking O-line. Appreciate you, you, know, you joining us today. Any, any final predictions So the two teams you cover, the Titans and the Steelers, give us a first-round prediction for both of those teams. Titans at 7, Steelers at 20. I got the Titans picking Joe Alts because it really could sure up the left side of the offense. I'm talking about two first rounders back to back um, for um, for for the Titans, and I think that can help out Will Levis, the weapons that they just got here, and that's one thing they've been lacking as of late since Taylor lewan has been gone. Who's going to anchor that left side? And I think Joe Alts the guy that can do that unless they move back. Right. Okay, and for the Steelers, I have been saying Jackson Powers Johnson. I know with Deontay Johnson getting traded to Carolina, there is a wide receiver need there. But if you walk in the Pittsburgh Steelers building, they have a wall of offensive linemen and the starters. Yeah, and then they have a section that says the center. Oh, they I, cut Mason Cole oh, earlier this off season. Yeah, um, JPJ. I mean, if J, if they if they draft JPJ, he's a future Hall of Famer because that's what the Steelers do. At center in the first round. Yeah. I mean, 
It, I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I would have if, if they're smart, they go after Jackson Powers Johnson, in my opinion, because Russ is back there and considering what they can do with Justin Field for years to come if he chooses to stay in Pittsburgh and they can give him a uh, a contract that'll keep him there over the long haul. Um it's not because I'm an offensive lineman. I picked those two p- picks for the teams I cover. I just think it makes sense if you're really trying to build an organization up. I was uh, I was just pulling up Ramon's grades, you know, to figure out exactly how much we did like him during his career. The grades were good. Though. The grades were good. So there's a uh, you know ten year stretch basically, right, of really high level pass blocking grades. So I decided to spit out where did he rank over that decade. Oh, look at you. That's good. That's nice of you. He cracked the top ten. In PFF pass blocking grade, Ramon comes in at number 10 with the best pass blocking grade over that time from among guards. That's awesome. See? That's why he likes us now. He knows. Now listen to this list. Listen to this list, Ramon. This is pretty good let me, company. Let me hear this list. Number one, Josh Sitton. Number two, Zach Martin. Number three, Marshall Yanda. Number four, TJ Yang. Uh, TJ Lang, rather. Then we get Brandon Brooks, uh, Kevin Zeitler, Joel Batonio, DeCastro. Uh, and then Brian Waters, who we just got the back end of his career in this in this area, and then you. Wow, it's a good list. Now, well, see, that was my specialty. Yeah, it was what we're saying. I was gonna get you in the phone book. You weren't Man. kidding. I, uh, again, we have your workout numbers too. You, those. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I no, won't go recite. ahead. It's, but because it's a true testament to hey, how much of a baller. Yeah, yeah. I you was, were a baller, <laughs> dude. The fact that you had the NFL career that you had. Yeah. Uh, so wait yeah, in. Tell three, the numbers. Tell uh, them. What do we got? 328. 65, 328. Ramon's so ni- a big guy. 90th percentile weight. He's a big guy. Uh, 557, 40 yard dash. 557? Five, five, yeah. five, five, you want to hear what's crazy behind that? Did you trip? <laughs> no. I should have. <laughs> I should have. I caught a nosebleed before I ran the 40 at the combine. At least it wasn't after. I'm not. Huh? Like, at least it wasn't after. Like the five five seven created a nosebleed. Oh that would have been rough. And then I didn't get an opportunity to redeem it because in my pro day I caught the flu. Ah, oh, I man. had a hundred and one okay, that's a, yeah. degree temp that All day. Right. So we got excuses. So that's why it would have been it would have been better. Would have been a four seven. Um, Let me live my life. We have some <laughs> estimates on like ten yard and twenty yards. They're they're in the first percentile. <laughs> but they're estimates, I think. Um, vertical was a twenty six. Yeah. And uh, that was 28th percentile. Broad jump, seven foot eight. That's fifth percentile <laughs> among guards. The shuttle, 20 yard shuttle is 4.98. That's 15th percentile. And the three cone was 7.96. That's 30th percentile. Um, I don't have, what's your arm length? I'll add it to the database here. Because uh, we don't have it 34 officially. 34 and a half inches. There 34 go. and a half. That, that, that would probably be 90th percentile for guards, I would yeah. guess. 100%. 34 and a half. And what's your hand? Because, again, we're just we're trying to ra- uh, round out the database. I think it's 10 inch hand. 10, okay. So Sorry. I'm going to add those at some point here so we've got your full data set. So, yeah, the, you are a, you're the modern marvel. That's an impressive career Thank that you, you had, Ramon. I mean, last Thank year... We ran the 40 in basically this, jeans, a sweatshirt, and, and sneakers. And that's the first number I've heard for a while that I was faster than. <laughs> that's yeah. fair. Well, that's yeah. fair. Because you're 150 pounds lighter. So Yeah. Also old as hell and unfit. That didn't help. <laughs> Whatever. Ramon had a great career. Stop making excuses top like 10, <laughs> Top 10 pass protecting guard in the NFL, Ramon Foster. Yeah. Um, former hater, now friend of the show. So. Now friends, so we we can say we're friends, right? We're friends. Yeah, yeah not just the show. We're friends. We're friends. We text oh, and everything. Right. So what what's what's crazy is though too, and I know we've got to wrap it up, but I, I do find it interesting that fan bases and teams like and dislike you depending upon what you guys say about their player. Yeah, hilarious how that works, right? That is a hilarious thing that happens. Yeah, I, I'll say it gives justification to the fans. It gives justification also to the players. So the players tweet you guys stuff out and post it and stuff like that. Uh, when it comes down to the O-line players, it always been my my thing is um, the justification of where to, this is the biggest thing, where the sacks are going or whose yeah. issue it was. I, at that, yeah. It's super complicated to get sometimes. I would, uh, I would actually suggest don't even look at the sack numbers. I think they're stupid. I mean, really? Well, so he, here's why. You know this. I mean, just think about this logically, right? If you have a bad block, right, defensive tackles by you, the difference between that becoming a sack, a hit, or a hurry is on Big Ben, right? If 
If there's yeah. a guy open and he gets rid of it, he just gets hit. Or if there's nobody open, it becomes a sack or whatever, right? And it's like, but we can look at you in isolation and say, that's a bad block. And so for us, the, the block is what's get, what gets graded. The sack, hit, or hurry doesn't change the PFF grade, so to speak. So there are some sacks that you gave up that were probably better blocks than, say, a hurry that you gave up because something else happened. So I always think that the stats for offensive linemen – I wouldn't use – usually they usually they're in the right ballpark. They tell the story. Like if you give up 10 sacks, it's probably – you know, you're probably not that great that year. But I would say that the grade does a better job of really isolating your part of the job. So, And, and so what – what so getting more into the details, and this is where I've had this conversation with y'all as far as yeah. like breaking down the hows and the what. What if somebody gets tripped? What if that sack that went on the – went inside We don't put that – we won't put that on gap. you. We wouldn't but put – what if a sack – Unless it's your fault, like you get bold and that's why oh, yeah, you that's tripped or whatever, or or you get bold and that's why you trip over the right tackle, something to that effect. But right. we're very cautious to not um, – like there was a service one year. I'm just giving you all the details because we have, we have time. There was another service at the point that had Mitchell Schwartz with like nine sacks allowed, and we had him with three. And it was like what's – and the other service was basically saying if you were – the guy that you were supposed to block had the sack, we're giving him – we're blaming the lineman. Whereas we don't do that. We say, hey, if the quarterback's depth is too deep and the edge goes around the tackle at like 12 yards, you're not supposed to block him at 12 yards, right? And we, So we can put that on the quarterback. Or if the quarterback gets flushed and you lose your leverage and your guy sacks him, we don't put that on you. So – we are very cautious to not blame the offensive linemen for, for leverage issues or things that are out of their control. We really try to isolate it, you know? So um, yeah. that's where I think we, we do put a lot of time and effort into the, into the nuance of, like, where blame and credit should really lie. Yeah. Cause it, it is a unique uh, position to play on the offensive line, especially, I say, interior, too, because you can send a defensive lineman to the center and the center just misses the communication that's on him, yeah. not necessarily on the guard. Like, there's yeah. there's different things that can happen in situations like that that we say, okay, all right, we got to look at this and see who's to blame for it. Right. Uh, but, of course, you survive as one and you die as one, too, on the yeah. offensive line. Yeah, and obviously, we're always, we try not to guess too much, and there's miscommunications in the whole thing, so... Um, it's a it's a challenging one, but we do our best, you know. So, no doubt, it's it's gotten a whole lot better. I will give you that. I like the conversations that we had. Yeah, it, they're always fun. So that's why that's why we're friends now. So anyway, Ramon, <laughs> we appreciate having you. Tell everybody, you know, where they can find all your stuff. Man, I'm on X now. I have two accounts. One of them is if y'all can get me in touch with Elon, that'd be awesome. But my old one, <laughs> don't DM use them. that one. My new one is at the Ramon Foster on X, and my new uh, and my Instagram is at the Ramon Foster. On Instagram, I got a radio show in Nashville, one zero four five The Zones, M- Zone Monday through Friday, six to ten, and I do a podcast daily uh, on YouTube, uh, the Ramon Foster Show. If you're a Steelers fan, don't watch it. Definitely. If you're not a Steelers <laughs> fan, don't watch it. I mean, uh, you're not talking to anybody here. Steelers fans don't watch us, so <laughs> you be sure. <shocked. laughs> I'm just kidding. We always mess with Steelers fans. Anyway, thank you, Ramon. We really appreciate it. We'll definitely do it again sometime. Anytime. Let's do it again, fellas. Thanks, man. Thank you. No doubt.